If you like the video, then please consider supporting Slopes Game Room on Patreon. You know, when it comes down to spooky games to cover on YouTube, most content creators just go and find a retro Nightmare on Elm Street or Friday the 13th game. Nah, you ain't got no idea. Here is the official Slopes Game Room Top 3 Moments I Pooped My Pants in Reverse Date Order. Number 1, Resident Evil 7. <laughs> Number two, Tomb Raider. And number three, Echo the Dolphin. <coughs> yep, screw films like Jaws. This game was pure fear for me as a kid. Seriously, I was extremely scared about going into the water after playing this. However, with that said, I was obsessed with the idea of Echo the Dolphin. And it was on my 7th birthday, I blew out the candles on my Leonardo Turtles cake, making a wish that the Mega Drive shaped present over there was indeed Echo the Dolphin. Ah, Nan. Uh, yeah, thanks, yeah. Batman Returns. I'm gonna love this. Ladies and gentlemen, you are looking at the only Mega Drive game I ever sold as a kid. To this day I still don't own this one back in my collection, mainly because I have this, but anyway. After just a few more months of saving, I got it. Echo the Dolphin for the Mega Drive. Now this game, if you have not played it, is not the game you would expect it to be. As a kid, I was intrigued by the great graphics, amazing world with sometimes spooky consequences, cool puzzles and exploration. But what I ended up getting was a sci-fi horror game. Seriously, I can't be the only one out there to have been caught out by this one. This game gets weird. So, join me as we take a look at the Echo the Dolphin complete history where we'll be looking at the crazy inspiration, the development, the people behind it, and of course, the games. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. You know what, if we set our minds on to Sega vs Nintendo, then what you could say is that Echo the Dolphin is the speedy blues answer to the slow red Zelda. What am I doing? Echo vs Zelda? Yeah, I'm pretty sure Zelda may win this one. Weirdly though, as I was such a hardcore Sega nut as a kid, I somehow convinced myself that this was in fact the better franchise. <laughs> what the hell was I thinking? Fanboyism can be an ugly thing. However, I can't deny that to this very day, the world of those early Echo the Dolphin games has fully stuck with me. And whilst I sit and watch Blue Planet 2 with the wife as it explores the weirdly strange and undiscovered depths of the ocean, I am intrigued. Intrigued to go back to the equally spooky and mysteriously luring world of Echo the Dolphin. But hold up, hold up, David Attenborough documentaries that drive up inspiration to classic Mega Drive games? Oh no, no, no. I think we're in fact getting a little ahead of ourselves. So, let's go back to the beginning. Introducing Ed Annunziata, the eventual creator of Echo the Dolphin. 
Over 20 years ago, he started working for Sega and straight out of the gate, he became the producer on the 1990 classic Mega Drive game, Spider-Man, and the 1992 release of Shikan the Forever Man. As good as these games were at the time, he just like so many others, wanted to create his own game. And pretty much since the beginning, he started to pitch this new idea he had that would really show off what he could do. It was something new, it was something exciting, and most definitely, something that breaks the norm. Obviously, side-scrolling platformers with smooth scrolling play fields and sprite was all the rage, and Ed wanted to change up that formula. Movement was the first thing that needed changing, and after he took the obvious platforming parts out of the generic platformer, he started to fill in the gaps. A game based in water. The idea of being able to propel yourself out of the water higher and higher, depending on how fast you controlled the nameless character, really intrigued him. And after getting this right, he began to choose the sea creature that would fill this role. Dolphins seemed to be the obvious choice for this new style of gameplay, and after reading the book Sounding by Hank Sells, which was his main inspiration for making the creatures in the game sentient, like I said, he went to Sega with his rough concept, and they said no. <laughs> Crazy, right? Well, not really. Take away what you know now and put yourself in the boots of one of those crazy Sega officials that signed off new ideas. This fairly new kid on the block with hardly any games under his belt at this time wanted to make a fairly realistic for the early 90s game where you control dolphins. Oh no no no, that's nowhere near ridiculous, tubular or demonic enough for this company. Who do you think we are, Nintendo? <laughs> Yeah, okay, obviously I'm exaggerating this, but what you got to understand is that even though Echo the Dolphin ended up becoming quite the cult classic for the 16 bits of blast processing that we had, it wasn't exactly an easy pitch. And it was only after producing games like the before mentioned Spider Man that two years and a plenty of pitching later, Sega finally decided to take a chance on Young Ed and Echo the Dolphin started development. Now we already mentioned sounding by Hank Sells, but to really get into the mindset of the mammals in this game, Ed remembers getting himself quite the library of books to research them, and within those books was one fairly big bit of inspiration. Now honestly, Take this next part of your development history lesson with the biggest grain of sea salt that you can find. The name Echo the Dolphin is believed to be taken from the true life stories of the ketamine drug filled NASA funded experiments of John C. Lilly. This insane story which I've in fact covered in full is clickable right here. I highly highly suggest checking that out before watching the rest of this video, as it's one of the most eye-opening videos I've ever made. But like I said, don't take it too seriously. Ed has admitted to knowing about these messed up stories, but in my opinion, like I said in that video, he didn't know it all, and I'm sure if he did, then we wouldn't be doing the complete history of Echo the Dolphin, but instead, I, I don't know, Dave the Dolphin? all will make sense after watching the video. So, now you've all seen it, shall we move on? As Ed was such a big fan of sci-fi, time travel and aliens, he quite successfully managed to zap this into the game too. Quite a strange couple of concepts to knock together, and without a doubt the one thing that surprised them most when consumers eventually played the game. Heck, it still surprises people to this day. So in case you are one of those gamers that are yet still to play this legendary title, well, here it is. Echo the Dolphin. Straight off the bat, I can tell you right now, that the game has aged considerably. It's actually quite a hard game to play nowadays, and in my opinion, it's far more enjoyable if you emulate it and use save states. 
Now I'm sure there are plenty of you out there that will scoff at such a disgusting term as huh, emulation. But like I said, the game has aged quite a bit. It's not bad, in fact it's actually quite good. However, the controls, the mechanics and the head-scratching puzzles are likely to put off newcomers or gamers that haven't played the game in a long time. So, the game starts with you having a little swim with your dolphin family, and honestly, I remember friends never really getting any further than this point of the game. Seriously! You swim, you swim, you jump out of the water, you look around for any random hole in the wall for you to slide through. Nothing. It's only those persistent players that kept experimenting that found out what to do. You see, only after speaking with one of your dolphin friends, the one that asked to see how high you can jump in the sky, when the dolphin excrement really hits the fan. A massive tornado type element sucks all of the marine life in that section along with Echo's pod and leaves you all sad and alone. This is when the true game begins. After speaking to other underwater creatures you venture to the underwater city of Atlantis, do some time travelling, go back to a prehistoric setting, find that your pod was actually abducted by aliens, go back, let it all happen again, fight the aliens yourself, all the while getting beaten the crap out of from every living sea creature going. Unfairly might I add. This game is crazy weird, I can't stress how confusing this bad boy is for the majority of gamers out there, but it's the bizarre, creepy and downright confusing plot twist wrapped in kid friendly wrapping paper that really does make it very appealing. Now like I said the game has aged quite badly, those controls can be extremely annoying, the baddies are very unfair and the puzzle mechanics force you to redo them over and over again, simply because doing something as simple as pushing a rock doesn't always work. Never as a game from the 16 bit era needed tweaking more. O okay, obviously I'm making a slight exaggeration there. The game is fully playable after all, but playing the game on the Mega Drive is in my opinion, too hard to find enjoyable. Do yourself a favour, go and play the game using other means that allow for save states. You will get far more enjoyment out of it if you do so. Now, there was quite a big reason for the insane level of difficulty. Yes, Ed was worried about gamers renting his game, completing it over the weekend, sending it back and killing all decent sales of the game. This scared him so much that he decided to actually make the game stupidly hard. Perhaps a little too hard if you ask me. Now this all may sound like I'm seriously hating on the game, and yes it is a bitch to play sometimes, especially when you're on the final stage, but the more you play it, the more that insane difficulty really starts to lend itself to the game's lonely atmospheric feel. Get past it, again in my opinion using save states, and you will be left with a game that is crazy unique, somewhat addicting, but most importantly, quite pleasurable to play. That is unless you're going past that bloody octopus. One of the other awesome aspects of the game that really gets you sucked in is the creepy music by Spencer Nilsson. This is the main guy responsible for this game's soundtrack, and Ed found the whole experience quite enjoyable, giving examples of the mood he was after whilst playing certain sections of the game. And apparently, Pink Floyd was one of the main influences for all of this. And depending on your preference, you can listen to the spooky tunes via the amazing Mega Drive sound chip, or on the Mega CD where the soundtrack was fully remastered. And apparently, this Mega CD version or Sega CD depending on where you live, not only has remastered audio, but the controls and levels have been tweaked too. But if that's still not good enough, they got refined even further when the game got ported to Windows. And if that is still not enough, then there is actually a fan made fixed and enhanced version that goes even further, and that one was released in 2014. And no, don't bother asking me, just go and Google it. 
On top of this, there's also a Game Gear and Master System version of the game. There is obviously a dumbed down version that does, however, look and sound really good, with a few variants on the in-game design to keep it fresh. Then you've got the Real One Arcade, a place where Sega decided to tackle the online downloadable game market, and Echo the Dolphin was one of the first free games that you could download and trial. And other than this, you can find it in all the usual places like Xbox Live, Mega Drive Collection, Steam, and easily best of all in 3D on your 3DS. Which by the way, also adds the Super Dolphin mode to attract newcomers, which gives you invincibility and unlimited oxygen. Day 19, I am concerned about the crew. After all, Echo the Dolphin is not just a game, it is an adventure. The graphics are so real, they don't want to go into the sea anymore. 27 levels of danger, mystery and beauty, all through the eyes of a dolphin. Simply brilliant. Thank goodness, my trusty skipper Pierre has no interest in this new game. So, with the game becoming a massive seller as you would expect, it didn't take long before Sega decided that a sequel needed to be made. Last night I dreamed I was a dolphin. My name was Echo and it was incredible. I was swimming in sparkling tropical waters. I battled sharks. I turned into a bird and I was flying. Then I survived it all to save the oceans from an evil alien power. It was fantastic. Hey! Huh? Oh man, get me out of here! New Echo, the tides of time. Sega! Ed had already planned out the story, or at least a rough idea of the story, before the first game was even finished. And although at first glance this may just seem like the same game done again with slightly tighter controls, let me tell you, it's far from it. First of all, the enemies in this game are a lot more fair, the controls, like I said, do feel slightly refined, and the graphics, especially Echo himself, have all had a light overhaul. Heck, even the music is better? Well, that's up for debate. I'm a huge fan of the eeriness of the first game, and this, well, is quite different. But on top of that, there are a few camera change levels that mix up the gameplay. You've got the infamous and gorgeous looking Sky Tide section, and Echo even has the ability to change into a couple of other creatures here and there. Which again, makes for a nice, although sometimes pointless, change of pace. For newcomers, this may be the better game. I do slightly prefer the atmosphere on that original, thanks nostalgia, but I can't deny that this was actually more enjoyable to play this time round. But what wasn't enjoyable was Echo Jr. Now obviously this wasn't aimed at me, and was part of the Sega Club Games in North America, a line of video games mostly released for the Genesis that would let onlookers know that this was a game for kids. I never liked these games, again not for me, but correct me if I'm wrong, giving a kid of any age something like this over something like this, and they will get far more enjoyment out of it. Don't just make a dumbed down version of an already better game which involves nothing but scavenger hunt type missions. Echo Jr. is easily the biggest downfall in the whole Echo franchise. Apart from that other Echo Jr. game that came out on the Sega Pico, which is not even worth playing at all, no matter what your age. <sighs> right, let's move on, shall we? It was five years before Echo would be seen again, and other than a short teaser for the 32X, and not forgetting this light tech demo for the Sega Saturn, but... That is all they were, tech demos. Nothing was ever made other than this, or at least that's what we believe anyway. Sadly, the original team are nowhere to be seen here, and Echo the Dolphin, Defender of the Future, the fourth game, or possibly fifth game if you include that Pico title, was Sega's attempt at rebooting the franchise. And therefore, it has absolutely no ties besides the name and star-headed Dolphin to the originals. So, what's it like? Well, most people will tell you it's crap, overlong, over-repetitive and incredibly bland looking. 
In all honesty, I remember not getting very far in this one myself, as I felt the same. Sega is all about pick up and play action games, well, for the most part, and this is no doubt why I am so into side-scrolling beat-em-ups and racing games over games like RPGs. But confusingly enough, when looking at reviews of the game when it came out, it pretty much got nothing but positive review scores. So, what happened in 18 years? Has the game aged that badly? Well, sort of. It has the camera controls that are annoying as all hell, and the levels do indeed look bland and boring. But let's be honest, misty greens or blues as far as the eye can see are pretty much all you would see as a dolphin in a 3D space. Yes, I know dolphins are colourblind, but you know what I'm trying to say. Another one of the reasons for this is perhaps the crazy story about how humans have been existing for millions of years and we once lived in harmony with dolphins. Ugh, look, I don't know, it just isn't doing it for me. Like I said, Ed had no involvement with this game, and everyone that was working on it had different opinions on what the game should be and how it should be played. Weirdly, some of the team didn't even know that there were early entries in this series, resulting in a worldwide development team half made up of fans and the other half made up of some of the dumbest video game plonkers in all of gaming. I mean, come on, who hasn't heard of Echo the Bloody Dolphin? Is it an open sandbox game? Well, sort of. Is it a Zelda clone, but underwater? Yeah, I suppose. Is it a shooter underwater? Look, maybe these massive design choices had the team which was based in different locations all over the world fighting to get their two cents in too. And on top of this, the game was broken for a very long time, with game breaking bugs heavily pushing back development even further. One of the crazier times during this game's development, like I said, already was its story. It was only when the game was already fully in development, with big gaming sections being completely playable already, that they hired sci-fi writer David Brin to try and somehow piece it all together into some kind of story. Obviously, with the game still not being finished, certain parts of the story getting changed again as developers continued to bicker over the game and its insanely confusing plot, even for an Echo game, it was eventually released in the late 2000s on the Dreamcast. And, again, like I said, it was widely accepted as an above average and in some cases, great game. The exciting adventures of a dolphin with Echo the Dolphin exclusively on Dreamcast. What can I tell you? Sometimes when development teams change up storylines constantly up until the very last minute in any medium, they do sometimes end up working out great. In fact, Echo the Dolphin Defender of the Future was even up for Game of the Year. So, firstly, the controls. Don't listen to what people say, they are not completely broken. In fact, they're actually quite good when you get used to them. Sure, nowadays they would be completely different, but when you master them, especially in that early tutorial level, you will find yourself swimming around doing crazy acrobatic type jumps and stunts that just wouldn't be doable with an easier control scheme. One of the worst things about this game is, as previously mentioned, the draw distance. Again, I'm looking at this with a new age pair of eyes, as for the time, it was quite good. And all I will say is that you do need to keep on your toes when playing this game. When you do eventually see an enemy that close to your face, you need to react instantly. As you would expect, the rest of the game is basically a puzzle game, and just like Ocarina of Time, a lot of the time, you're using different songs that you've learned up to this point to make certain marine life follow you or do different actions. All in all, I really enjoyed working with other fish to help get me to the next part of the level previously unreachable. 
Sure, the whole thing feels pretty wonky compared to what we have nowadays, but once I finally sit down after an hour or so, I really did start to get sucked into the game's mechanics. And sure, there are some cheap deaths and pretty hard to master fighting mechanics among other annoyances. I gotta say, I'm surprised. I enjoyed this game. However, I didn't actually finish it, as people that would have played it will tell you it's brutally hard when you get closer to the end. But eventually, I think I will. I'm glad I own this one in my Dreamcast collection. And although Ed wasn't a part of it, I actually think it's a nice way for Echo to go out. Yep, this was the last game. It got ported quite successfully two years later on the PlayStation 2, and well, that's it. A sequel was made, and it is fully downloadable for you to burn and play onto your Dreamcast at your leisure. But in all honesty, it's not much more than six open areas with no story and next to no objectives. None of us fans know what Echo 2 Sentinels of the Universe was going to be about, but it is still fun to explore. So, there you go, 4 or 5 games, 1 unreleased game that we know of, and a couple of tech demos. Echo the Dolphin is one of the most unique and mysterious Sega IPs that everyone claims to know about. But in all honesty, in my personal experience, that's not the case. Hopefully this video has answered the endless questions surrounding this strange series, and hopefully it's intrigued you to go and pick up a copy for yourself, to at least try it out. Oh yeah, and if anyone finds this version, feel free to send it my way. One of the rarest Mega Drive games ever made. The legendary status of this sparkly four-headed mammal still goes on to this very day, and Ed Anutiata actually attempted to make a new game in the franchise. Well, a spiritual successor at least, over on Kickstarter. Sadly, it didn't hit target. So all we have are these impressive and luring screenshots and images. I would personally love a new Echo game. I'm not sure what it will be like, but I know I want it. Perhaps this is the perfect example of be careful what you wish for, as there seems to be an extreme love for this funky mammal. And if I'm going to be honest, I'm not too sure it would sell as well as I'd like. Regardless, Sega really should at least build up the hype for this incredible IP. Chuck him in some cameos, I mean come on. Where was my underwater stage in Sonic All-Star Racing Transformed? Seriously, the Sky Tides. This could have easily been this game's answer to the freaking Rainbow Road. Am I right? Hey there guys, thanks for checking out the video. It's the part of the video where I give my usual shout outs to all of my Patreons. But first, it is currently 1am on New Year's Eve and I just want to say a big, big Happy New Year to everybody watching, Patreon or not. Thank you all so, so much for supporting the channel this year. But anyway, as usual, I want to give a special shout out to Ryan Burford, Joe Lazarus, Ian A. Chapman, Phil Lowlands, Yoshi Vu, Retro to Next Gen, Zane Powers, Gavin the Dolphin, JL87, Casey Garner, Blitz Hedgy, Ben Hall, Taylor Almond, Stu Noonham, Petite Mew, Boo White, Brian Rawson, Leo and Seal, Sin Killer J. Takikawa, and of course, Tiago Piera dos Santos Silva. If you want to be part of this list, get your name shown or get your name shouted out, be part of the Discord chat where you get to share your creations and speak to other like-minded people and of course see what I'm working on as well as some exclusive content, then please click the link that you see on the screen. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell and for all you people out there sharing my content, please don't stop. Literally one share can make a big difference to each video. But anyway, that's enough from me. This is DJ Slope signing out, and hopefully, I'll see you all next time.